Because by the world has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. come in often and I love live music but a friend of mine named Mark Rust used to come and play quite often and he's from the Ithaca area of New York and he plays hammer dulcimer and mountain dulcimer and spoons and pretty much anything with strings and spoons and he was a lot of fun so he taught all the kids how to play spoons and that was that was really cool we did that at church so nice excellent all right, so we're not able to pass the plate, but we are still uh, taking offering for the church. Um, you may have seen the box up at the top of the ramp there that uh, says offering on it. So um, if you haven't had a chance to yet, or if you're able to, that's where we're, we are receiving offerings. But we do want to take the time each week to pray over the offerings that we do receive. So let us take a moment to pray over the offerings that have come in. Gracious God, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for the gifts and graces that people bring to the church. The fact that even through their presence and through the things that they offer of their time, that is an amazing gift to the church. And we give you thanks for those. We also give you thanks for the monetary donations and gifts that come into the church. They are necessary for us to be able to care for this community of Springvale, but also the community beyond Springvale and the world at large. Uh, we ask that you bless the gifts that have been received and the gifts that will be coming in, that you add your, your spirit and blessing to them and multiply them so that we may be your hands and feet in the world in the way that you call us to be. And we ask all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. And uh, so we're going to uh, sing our next hymn, our hymn of preparation. And we're just doing the chorus of it. And it's Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. And we're going to sing that three times. It's fairly easy. So uh, turn your eyes upon Jesus. It's turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes, I'm sorry, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So we'll sing it through three times. Um, so if you could join us, join me in that. And the louder you sing, the less you have to listen to me. So that'll be perfect. All right. So turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim 
in the light of his glory and grace. One more time. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Amen. Thank you. Scripture reading. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, church. Good morning. Um, I'm going to be reading two um, scripture readings. The first is Exodus 18, 13 to 27. The next day, Moses took his seat to serve as a judge for the people. And they stood around him from morning till evening. When his father-in-law saw all that Moses was doing for the people, he said, what is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone sit as a judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Moses answered him, because the people come to me to seek God's will. Whenever they have a dispute, it is brought to me and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instruction. Moses' father-in-law replied, What you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You cannot handle it alone. Listen now to me and I will give you some advice and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way they are to live and how they are to behave. But select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain, and appoint them as officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at all times but have them bring every difficult case to you. The simple cases they can decide themselves that will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. If you do this and God so commands, you will be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. They served as judges for, for the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided themselves. Then Moses sent his father-in-law father on his way, and Jethro returned to his own country. The second scripture is... Matthew 17, 1 to 8. After six days, Jesus took with, with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. These are the words of our Lord. Thanks be to God.
Father God, there's something inspiring about the chance and the opportunity to stand under a roof that you have made instead of man. At this moment, we ask that the scripture that we've heard and the message that we will hear touch our hearts, touch our minds, become important to us. And that can happen only as the Holy Spirit comes and dwells with your servant. We ask for that. We know he has prepared and we know that he knows your word and we know that it is your word. May we be so wise that we also will stand, sit, follow and pray that the message that is here today may become a part of us and our knowledge and our work. We ask, Lord, in the precious name of your Son, amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. So I'm very thankful this morning to be able to share probably one of my favorite subjects in church, and that's discipleship. Um, if I could identify any gifts that I feel like I have stronger than even any others, I think it's that specifically. Um, so we're going to be talking about discipleship, Jesus style, a little bit. But before we get to that, I want to talk to you about uh, teamwork a little bit. Is anyone familiar with the monument climb ceremony that happens at the Naval Academy each year? Has anyone ever heard of that before? I had pictures for you, but I can't show you the pictures here today, so I'm going to have to paint the picture for you. At the end of the plebe year, which is the very first year for any uh, person going through the Naval Academy, there's a ceremony that marks the very end. And they take a 21-foot monument called the Herndon Monument, and they grease it with lard completely from top to bottom. And then they have people with hoses just spraying onto the oil so that it makes it really nice and slippery. And then on the very top of the monument, they put something called a Dixie Cup. Anybody familiar with the Navy? All right, in the Navy, they have Dixie Cup hats, all right? And it looks like a Dixie Cup. That's what they call them. So on the very top of the monument is a Dixie Cup hat. That's the hat that the plebes have to wear during their whole first year. So their job is the plebes have to go down, they have to climb up on this monument, they have to take the Dixie Cup off, and they have to replace it with a combination cover, which is uh, like an officer-style uh, military cap. So they have to put that on top, and that marks the end of their plebe year and the beginning as a midshipman in the rest of their career at the Naval Academy. So how many of you think that we could climb a greased monument today if we just set it up right out here in the playground? Greased monument. Everybody up? <laughs> All right. But they do it every single year. And the way they do it is all the plebes come, and it's close to 1,000 people coming and gathering around this place, and they have to get up that 21-foot monument. So what they do is they take the largest members of their class, and they circle them around the bottom of the monument, and they cross arms. And then others, less large, get on top of their shoulders, and they begin making like a human scaffolding uh, that goes up the monument. And then one of the smaller members of the class will climb on top of each of the shoulders of those classmates to get to the very top of the monument. And the person that gets to the top and gets to replace the cover is the one that gets to keep the combination cap as a trophy. But there's no way that that person could have gotten to the top of the monument without climbing on the backs and the shoulders of the rest of their classmates. Every single person around that monument is a part of achieving that task and that goal. It could not happen if it were not for all of them working together to make it happen. And you could tell which classes have developed the teamwork uh, strategy the best based on the amount of time that it takes them to be able to climb that monument. Um, with all the rules in place for the grease and everything else, I think one of the fastest times they've had is like 20 minutes, 
Many of the classes take two hours or more to be able to climb that monument. If you haven't seen it, it's a lot of fun. It's very funny as well. Uh, but if you go on YouTube, you can take a look at uh, a video of them making that happen. And the whole time, you're being sprayed with hoses. You've got grease all over you. Total fun. Sounds like a great youth group event all in one. Um, and I got to experience some of that teamwork when I was in boot camp. Uh, to this day, I still don't quite know how we did it other than we really had some great teamwork going on. But in the morning when they woke you up, um, anybody ever been to boot camp? Okay, a few of us, definitely. Uh, they come in and they just shake you and say it's time to get up and give you a cup of juice, right? No, not at all. The door bursts open, trash cans go flying, people are yelling at you from the get-go, and it's not a set time, so it's any time they feel like coming into the barracks and starting to wake you up. And normally they're yelling, get down, because you have to get down into push-up position, correct? Well, I was the top rack of a three-high bunk bed, which means I had two other guys below me, poor guys. Because when they yell, get down, and you're asleep, and you're just trying to get down into push-up position, what I would do is just roll out of the rack, and whatever was below me, I landed on, and that was it, and then get into push-up position. From there, in push-up position, they would tell us what we needed to do for that day. And pretty much that marked the beginning of a 20-minute time in which we had to get ourselves ready, everything done in the barracks and outside into inspection lines in the parade field. So here's the things that we had to take care of. In that 20 minutes, we had to use the facilities. We had to take a shower. We had to shave. Inspection ready shave. I'll tell you about that sometime. We had to get into our uniform and make sure that it was proper for inspection. We had to make our racks, hospital corners and everything else, we had to make sure that they were ready for inspection as well. We had to clean and prepare the barracks for inspection, which included swabbing the deck of the entire barracks. And we had to go around and make sure that the combination locks on our, uh, our lockers were zeroed, which means all of them had to be on zero. Anything that wasn't done, they took a red grease pen and went around and if there was a dust bunny on the floor, they circled it. And if you've ever tried to get grease pen out of anything, not a lot of fun. But we had to get the entire barracks ready for inspection. We had to have ourselves ready for inspection, all the other stuff done, and in 20 minutes be out on the parade field ready for inspection. And the fact that we got it done not just in 20 minutes, but oftentimes in less than that, still is remarkable. How many of you get yourselves ready in the morning in less than 20 minutes, just yourself? Good job, that's excellent. And cleaning the house and getting the dishes done and all that, <laughs> but it, it was just all this incredible, tremendous amount of work that had to happen that could not have happened if we weren't working together as a team and making that take place. And it, you know, I wish I could do that to this day, but I don't know if I could anymore. But if I had that team of people, I bet I could. What I, do, what I do know is this. Teamwork, the teamwork that we had was magical. It was absolutely incredible. And I look back on that teamwork that we had fondly. I've seen some of that same teamwork on mission trips. Anybody been on a mission trip before? Okay, I hope that we get to do even more mission trips together. I was. So impressed with you all having 39 people signed up for this past summer's mission trip. I'm sorry that it got canceled, but I look forward to others in the future. The first, one of the first mission trips I went on was an Appalachian service project working in uh, Appalachia. And I went on it, and I didn't know the team of kids that I'd be working with. Um, and most of them were fairly young. And I had this thought in my mind I was going to spend most of the time teaching kids how to do different, different things uh, in the construction project at the place. So I get there and they said, we're going to have you working in this back room. We've got drywall that needs to take place. And I was like, OK. I don't like drywall, but I can do drywall. I can teach people how to do drywall. And they're like, no, you don't have to teach anything. Um, and they bring over this 15-year-old girl that comes up, shakes my hand, and says, I am the drywall queen. 
And she was, man. She could do, I learned how to do drywall more than I ever knew from this young lady. She could drywall like nobody's business. And she not only could do it, but she could teach it really, really well. I was so impressed with her. She did such a great job. And she was infectious. She was such a great leader. She didn't just do it herself. She showed other people. So by the end of the time that we were there on the mission trip, she had taught other people how to do drywall so that they could go and teach other people how to do drywall as well. Um, wonderful young lady. And then there's a mission in the Baltimore area called Baltimore County Christian War Camp. It's very similar to Servants that takes place here in York County. And <clears throat> we always had um, teams that would go out and do things. My team was a ramp team. So we like to make handicap ramps. So on our ramp team, we divided up into various teams. I taught other youth how to be a cut team person. So the cut team, they would be in charge of the chop saw. They would have to measure, they would have to cut, and they would have to get the materials over to the rest of the team to do the work. I had kids from age 13 up that were trained and knew not only how to do it, but could also teach other people how to do the cut team. Uh, they had uh, adults that would come by, supervisors, to make sure we were doing OK. And they were so impressed with these, these kids at how they were able to do, not just in doing the cuts, but also in teaching other people the proper safety protocols and everything else on using those saws. We also had a dig team. These were the kids that just loved to hit things with a shovel and a dig bar and everything else. And they could dig all the uh, footing holes that we needed. And then we had tread team. That's where Joelle came in all the time. She loved being on the tread team. And they would put the treads on the ramp and screw those treads in and make sure that those were going. And they would keep yelling out measurements to the cut team to make sure that they had the proper dimensions for their treads. And then we had the drink and sunscreen moms. And this didn't just have to be moms. This could be kids, too. They made sure everybody stayed hydrated. They made sure everybody had sunscreen on. And having all those teams working together made those ramps come together in such an incredible way. Um, we got them done more quickly. We got them done more efficiently. We got them done more safely because we worked together as a team to make that happen. Teamwork really does make the dream work in so many situations. In church, teamwork is necessary, but it begins with discipleship. It begins with showing other people what it means to be a, a disciple of Jesus Christ, what it means to love God, what God calls the church to do so that they understand what that is and know where they fit into the team that is the body of Christ. In our scripture lessons today, we see those lessons coming through. We have Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, coming to Moses and saying, what in the world are you doing? Anybody ever have a father-in-law say that to you? <laughs> I have. Um, but <clears throat> coming and saying, why are you taking on so much? Why are you taking on all the things that you're taking on when you have an entire community of capable people around you? You need to go find people that are able. Give them the skills and the tools and the responsibility that they need to be able to do things so that you don't have it all on you. So Moses did that. He found capable people. He gave them responsibility over different things within that role. And he oversaw it all, but he had other people helping him to get it done. Such a necessary thing. You see, we were never made to do it by ourselves. And this is an example of where God, through Jethro, is giving us that example. And then we have Jesus going up on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he takes with him Peter, James, and John. He didn't have to. How many times in Scripture do we see Jesus going off by himself someplace to spend time with God? He could have gone off on his own. He could have gone up and spent time with God and seen God's presence and hearing God's voice. But he took Peter, James, and John with him. You see, just like Moses was training up other leaders, Jesus was preparing his disciples for the leadership that he would be leaving them with. 
Peter, James, and John, specifically, he was pouring into them even there. When do you hear about Peter, James, and John again? In the Garden of Gethsemane. Who are the ones that Jesus asked to pray for him while he goes off and prays in the garden? Peter, James, and John. So we'll understand a little bit more about that when I talk even deeper about discipleship with that. God has never intended us to go it alone. In the beginning, God recognized the human need for help and companionship, which led to Adam losing a rib and the creation of Eve, correct? We need each other. We need other people around us. We're not meant to do it alone. It's a part of creation that we have help in different ways. You see, Jesus took this all a step further for us as we see in his relationship with Peter, James, and John. While Jesus had 12 disciples and he had many other followers, the one thing that Jesus was setting an example for is how many people we um, humanly can pour ourselves into uh, in the course of our lives. How many people can we invest in in the course of our lives, like really share our hearts, share our spirits, share our knowledge and everything else? At any given time, the most anybody really can do well is three people. If you really want to show someone, disciple them, mentor them, and everything else, you could do up to three people at a time and really give them a sense of who you are and what you're about and what they are being called to be. So for Jesus, he took on Peter, James, and John, and he invested in them. He taught, and he walked with, and he did missions with all his disciples, but he had some special lessons and special messages for Peter, James, and John. He was sharing his life and his faith and his knowledge with them. He was making way for others to not just follow, but lead. Because he knew when he was gone, he had to have people that could step into his shoes like we talked about last week and be able to continue that mission. We become disciples who make disciples who in turn make even more disciples when we learn how to be a disciple. Had Jesus not invested himself in Peter, James, and John, what would have become of the church after Jesus was crucified? Each of us are meant to be disciples who make disciples. It's not just my job. It's not just a staff person in the church's job. Every single one of us is called to be a disciple maker. One of the first places you could be a disciple maker is if you're a parent. And parents, you're probably one of the most important disciple makers that we have in the church. And that begins with your kids. You know, that's such a necessary and important function. One thing I learned in youth ministry years ago that has never been changed at all, it's always going to be constantly true, is the number one influence in every kid's life, especially around issues of faith, is going to be their parents. It doesn't matter how good their Sunday school teacher is, how good their pastor is, how good their youth leader is. It doesn't matter who else they have in their life. The number one influence on faith is going to be mom and dad. Teaching them to pray, the importance of prayer. Teaching them the importance of reading scripture. Taking time to do devotions together. Making sure that they get involved in Sunday school, in youth group. Going through confirmation classes taking the time to share your own faith journey and faith story with them is going to help them become disciples who will then in turn go on to make other disciples, either of their own kids or of other people. You have such an important role that you can do and do really well. Grandparents, you discipled your kids and you have, the, you have the opportunity to disciple your grandkids as well. You may have generational gaps. You may have things that are different between how you grew up and how they're growing up. But the one thing that you have that every grandparent has ever had is the ability to love them. You can share your life with them, share the stories of the family with them, come alongside of them. Let them know that you care and that you're invested in who they are and who they're becoming. Support your kids as they take time to disciple their own children. 
And you can be amazing disciple makers in your own family. Maybe you don't have kids, maybe you don't have grandkids, but you could be a trusted, faithful adult in the life of other people in the church, of other youth in the church, of other kids in the church. You can take the time to say, I'm going to invest in this kid. I'm going to let them know that they matter. I'm going to pray for them even when they haven't asked me to. When I see them in church on Sunday, I'm going to come up and I'm going to say, hi, how are you? I'm so glad to see you. I'm so glad that you're here, and I just wanted you to know that you matter, and I'm praying for you, and you'll change a person's life forever. You'll have made another disciple of Jesus Christ. Ministry leaders, whether you're trustees, whether you're media team, whether you're finance, whether you're ad board, whatever you are, you are a disciple maker. You have an important ministry that helps the church continue forward and do amazing things. Teach other people what it means to do your job, to what your ministry means to the life of the church. Help them develop a passion and a calling for helping to make that continue, and the church will become so much better and grow in amazing ways because they'll know not only what to do, but why it's important to do it. Be a disciple maker, maker in your ministry area. Young adults, kids that have grown up as youth in the church, you know the church real well. You knew it from Sunday school, YF, all the different things. Take the time to pass that torch to others. Help others behind you develop the same passion, faith, and love that you have for ministry and for the church. Youth, do the same for the children that are behind you. One thing I've always thought was important was the idea of passing the torch. You've gained the light of Christ. Share the light of Christ with others as well. As a church, we are all in this together. We are not alone and we are never meant to be. I, as your pastor, cannot do it all by myself, nor was I meant to. And nor is it in my gifts to be able to do all of it. My intention is to pray for, identify, and invest in the lives of some faithful and called leaders who will go forth and make even more disciples. At the same time, I will teach and preach the word of God and point everyone toward the cross of Jesus Christ. But in everything... I intend to do it with the help of the Holy Spirit and the support and backing of each of you. One thing I never intend to do is point towards me because it's not about me. It's always about Jesus Christ. And if you ever see me pointing toward me instead of Jesus Christ, call me out on it. Hold me accountable. I want to be the best pastor I can be for you. I want to be the best person that I can be. And that's through help from all of you, through accountability from each of you, too. And I'll do the same for you. As you saw, as you heard when I was describing the plebes um, at the Naval Academy, it took everyone working together to conquer the greased monument. Together and with Christ, we, we can and will conquer anything life throws at us, even in putting together an outside worship in just a few days. So thank you for your gifts and graces and making that happen and for all of you coming out and being a part. So beloved, I invite you to join me in following the advice of Jethro and the example of Jesus Christ in discovering how God is calling you to be both a disciple and disciple maker in the life of this church. We need you and God made you just for this. In Psalm 139, we are reminded that each of us were knit together in our mother's womb and that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. So it's who we are, and it's who we are all made to be. We are made to be disciples. We are made to be children of God. So let's be disciples who make disciples. Amen.